Oh, there we go. Okay, so to get started, it is early in the morning, and I've been experimenting with this motion in my life, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about it, but first I want to show it to you, and I want you to practice it with me today. So stand up, stand up. We're going to get our blood flowing here, and it goes like this. You're going to curve in like this as much as you can, and then you're going to expand out like this. And when you curve in like this, I want you to feel the tension in your body. And when you expand out and you reach wide and your heart lifts and your head lifts, I want you to feel the freedom and the release. Just do that two more times. In, curved, out, expand. In, curved, out, expand. All right. Take a deep breath and have a seat. Harmful or harmless? That is the question. That is what I had put on the back of my high school senior t-shirt. You know, you've got your class shirt and on the back everybody would put a little phrase or something to describe themselves or name or whatever. Well, my last name was Harm. And so I put harmful or harmless, what do you think? And it was kind of a funny thing, and yet it was also a serious thing. Because from the age of, I don't even remember, as long as I can remember, I felt like I had these two people inside of me. There was the good girl who was always the teacher's pet, and always the one to get chosen, you know, to, to run an errand or to be responsible, to get things done. That was the good girl, the harmless version of Laura. And then there was this other side of me that came out, um, the one that after a day of serving in the church or taking care of my sisters would go out at night and drive around country roads with a 12-pack of beer with my friends and... Um, and do things that I was not so proud of. And then wake up and go to church the next morning and, and put on my good girl face again. So harmful or harmless, what do you think? And it's interesting because even though I knew Jesus, I've known Jesus from the day that I was born, as my mom rocked me in her arms, I knew of him, but I didn't know him in the fullest sense. Like, I knew of him in my mind, but I didn't know of him in my heart and in my soul. And I think that gets the root of that question, harmful or harmless, the angel, the demon, the good and the bad, the mess and the miracle. We are all both of those things all of the time as human beings. As much as we try to be only the miracle, only the good, only the angel, there's something in us that keeps pulling us back to the harmful side, right? To the mess. And so it's this tension that we live with on this side of heaven. And it's painful and it's awkward and, and it's hard to wrap our minds around it, especially when you're a teenager, and you're feeling pulled in both directions. Your parents are telling you, do this, do this, do this. You'll have a good life. And your friends are like, no, let's do this. Let's have fun. You know, we're only kids once. And, and it's like this pull inside of you. It's a war, you guys. You have a war going on inside of you. And it's important to recognize the war, and it's important to understand it, and I'm not going to give you information today, because I have a feeling that you're tired of information. You're tired of people telling you what to do. Instead of information today, I'm going to give you an invitation and some inspiration for a different way to live, a different way to live that looks like hope, and it feels like freedom. We're talking about forgiveness today. And forgiveness is one of those weighty God things that you can't take at face value. The things of God are never simple. The things of God are mysterious. They have layers like 
an onion. And, and as soon as you think you, you understand it, it, it unwraps to another layer that's deeper and, and more mysterious. And, and that's the way it's supposed to be because we're not God because we're messy miracles. And so forgiveness is one of those things. And so you're not going to leave here today with like the perfect answer of how to receive forgiveness from God and how to grant forgiveness to others. But I want to inspire you and I want to show you a glimpse and give you a taste of the freedom that comes with forgiveness. Forgiveness of yourself and the ways you've messed up and forgiveness of others who have hurt you badly and you're still reeling with the pain that they have inflicted on you. So on your sticky note, I want you to do two things. On one side, write the name of somebody who has harmed you, somebody who has hurt you, who you have yet to forgive. You are withholding forgiveness because it's too painful. And even the thought of forgiving this person, like, you just can't even wrap your head around it. Like, there's no way you can forgive this person for what they did. It could be something small. It could be something big. But, like, you're just holding on to it. You're not ready to let it go. Just write, write a name or write a phrase um, on one side of the paper. And then on the other side of the sticky note, I want you to write something that you have yet to forgive yourself for. Something you thought, something you said, something you did, something you didn't do that you feel like you should have. Just a word. Just It only means something to you. You're not going to share it. It's just for you. And then I want you to take that piece of paper and fold it up and hold it in one of your hands. And keep, keep holding it for the duration of the time that I'm speaking. Hold it in your hand. If you were taking notes, hold it in the hand you don't write with, right? Forgiveness is mysterious. But it is also a gift. And to understand forgiveness, we need to go back to the beginning and we need to understand what the problem is. Why forgiveness is such a necessary thing in our lives to begin with, all right? So I want to take you back to the garden, to Adam and Eve, who are walking along with God in complete freedom, in complete relaxation and joy. They're living in the miracle. There is no mess. Just miracle with God. And so I envision them walking with their hands outstretched, just like we were practicing before, in complete freedom. And then what happens? They turn in on themselves, and they begin to want something other than what God had planned for them. They want the fruit from the tree. Have you ever thought about that the first sin really happened before Eve picked that apple. That was the action, right? But she had to have the thought first. She had to think, oh, there is something that I want that's better for me than what God told me. In essence, she went from freedom to what we call turning in on herself. There's a Latin word for it. And it means, it means a man turned inward. It's homo incurratus on se. Man turned inward. And so the first sin happened. She thought it. She did it. And then what happened? Adam and Eve went, and they hid. Does this look like a familiar pose? Yeah. They hid. No longer were they free to just receive. They were turned inward on themselves. They were ashamed and they hid. And since that day, men and women have been born in the fetal position, curved in on themselves from the time that you were in your mother's womb. Have you thought about that? Adam and Eve weren't born from a womb. I think, you know, God raised them from the dust, and so I don't know, I kind of imagine it like this dust ball spinning and they were just standing there, you know, standing, here I am, God. 
But from sin's time forth, we were born curved inward. And you guys, this is the problem. The problem is sin. But we tend to think of sin as just being the actions that we make, the things that we do that we're not supposed to do or the things that we don't do that we're supposed to do. But it goes deeper than that. Remember, the things of God are always mysterious. They're always deep. There's always more than what we see. So the real problem is that human beings are turned inward. That is sin in us. Inward. And that's where anxiety comes from. That's where pride comes from. All of the roots of sin come from us turning inward and thinking that we know better, that our desires are more important than God. Or even if they're not more important, in the moment we choose to go inward and to feed ourselves, man turned inward is sin. But here's the thing. God loved people so much that he made a way through the Old Testament, right, for sins, for this curved inward to be forgiven. But it always required a sacrifice. Have you noticed that? You guys still holding your papers? Have you noticed that forgiveness before Jesus always required a sacrifice of blood? Blood had to be shed in order for God to forgive the sinful thoughts and deeds, actions, behaviors of the people. Until the time was right, and a baby was born in a mother's womb, Jesus Christ was born just like us, curved inward. And yet, he was different. Because even though he was born inward, As a human, he was at the very same time the son of God. And Jesus was different because he did not live his life inward. He lived his life outward. There was never a person Jesus met that he did not love. There was never a sin that Jesus saw that he could not offer forgiveness for. And so Jesus was At the same time, he was human. He had been born into human flesh. And at the same time, he had the grace of God, and he lived among us. And that is why, you guys, you can ask almost anyone in the world, whether they are Christian, whether they are Muslim, whatever religion, even atheists, most people love Jesus. Jesus lived He lived in a way that nobody had lived before and in a way that nobody will ever live again. And it's fact. It's history. It's there. In other books besides the Bible, you could go read them. Jesus lived. And he lived in such a way that even people who don't believe that he's the Christ, that he is the Son of God, they like him. They go, yeah, that Jesus was a good guy. They recognize something in him. And so what does Jesus do? You know that Jesus never asked anybody to worship him. People did worship him, but Jesus never said, worship me. What did Jesus say? Follow me. This was different. This was different. Jesus says, follow me. Live like I live. Don't live in world inward bound, curled up, focused on your own needs, your own desires, your own wants. Live free. In fact, so free that he was willing to walk a road and go to a cross in the ultimate display of grace and mercy. And how was he nailed to that cross? Arms wide open. And how is your body made? Have you ever recognized that your body is made in the shape of a cross? And so when we live our lives focused inward on our sin and on ourselves, we we are at war and we are losing the war. 
But when we focus on the fact that Christ on that cross chose us, he willingly went to pay the price for our inwardness, and he displayed it in an outwardness of love that the world had never seen and the world will never see again. It's powerful, this image of Christ on the cross taking my sin, taking your sin. He was whispering your name on that cross. And have you ever thought about the fact that God, looking down on his son, his son in a pose of ultimate humility and in the pose, the posture of what a child would do to their mother, Pick me up. I need your help. And God, in his love for you, left his son to die. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said as he hung there, Lord, forgive them. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was saying, Father, forgive Laura for all of the times that she turns inward on herself. And he was saying, Father, forgive everybody, everybody. It was finished on that cross. And because of the cross of Jesus, we now have this ability to live in what I call the ocean of forgiveness. Does anybody have a ponytail holder? I'm sweating up here. Thank you. Before Jesus, God required a sacrifice. He required a sacrifice through Jesus to forgive us the ultimate display of grace, right? And now there is this ocean of forgiveness that surrounds us. And so it's not so much a question of how do we forgive or how do we how, what do we have to do to earn forgiveness or to give forgiveness? It's a question of just reaching out and accepting it. You see the difference? We don't have to work anymore. We don't have to sacrifice anything. Forgiveness is a gift, a complete gift. Grace is a free gift. And this is so hard for our messy miracle minds to wrap itself around because we're not used to getting something for nothing, right? Your parents tell you if you want to get good grades, you got to work hard. If you want to get into a good college, you got to do the work. In this world, most things happen by earning our way toward them. Forgiveness is different. Forgiveness is free. And it's out there. God has done it. Christ has done it. And Christ is in everything and everyone. So when we are harmed against or when we harm others, it's because of our inward sinful nature. When we're called to forgive, all we have to do, it sounds so crazy, all we have to do is change our posture and open our hands to receive it. How do you forgive someone who has hurt you? You don't do the forgiving, my friend. You reach out into the ocean of forgiveness, and you ask God to do the forgiving for you. I have this cat. His name is Toby, and he's this little tiny black cat. I mean, like, we call him a nugget. We're like, Toby, our little nugget. And he, um, he wants to be loved so badly, okay? He's like, he'll climb next to you and like meow, 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 and climb up on your leg. And then as soon as you start to pet him, as soon as you start, he like, he doesn't know how to be loved. He, he starts to like stretch and he like goes like this and he can't stay in one place. So you literally, if you want to pet him and he wants to be petted, you have to chase him all around the room in order to pet him. And yet he's craving it. He's like, you know, he, you feel so bad for him because he just wants to feel loved, but he doesn't know how to let you love him. And this is what forgiveness is. This is how God feels about us. Like, we're like Toby. We're like, God, I want to feel your love and I want to feel your forgiveness, but, but I think maybe I got to do it this way or no, I got to be in this position or this room. And, and God's like, I, I'm trying to catch you, Laura. 
I'm trying to catch it. I'm trying to pet you, and I'm trying to love you. I know you want to be loved, but you're not, you're not staying still. You don't have your arms wide open. Let me love you. And the people in our lives feel the same way. And so when it comes to forgiveness, you're holding that paper tight in your hand. When it comes to forgiveness, I think what is required of us is a different posture. A different posture of our heart, a different posture of our mind, and even a different posture of our physical body. And I've been practicing this. I've been practicing this, this um, movement of my body when I find myself turning inward and, and feeling angry or feeling stressed out or feeling anxious and literally saying, no, no, I have access to the ocean of forgiveness and grace and peace that Christ has won for me. I have access to that. It is all around me. And so I am going to change my posture. And as I do it with my physical body, it's like something happens from the top all the way down to my feet. And suddenly forgiving my daughter for not putting her socks away and holding on to that all throughout my day goes away. Like, there's an ocean of grace and love and mercy around me. Why do I want to hang on to that grudge? Now, I'm not here to say that it's not painful and that people haven't hurt you in your life and that, that forgiveness is um, somehow making that be okay or giving them permission or, or that we should pretend that it didn't happen. No, not at all. In fact, in your small groups, I have questions for you to answer that come from the book called The Book of Forgiveness by Desmond Tutu. And you guys have to read this book. It's about the South Africans and all of the bloodshed that they experienced and how they were able to reconcile and forgive. And he lays out four steps of forgiveness. And the first step for forgiveness is to tell your story. We are allowed to tell our stories of our hurts to God and to others. And, we are, and then we name the hurts, how we feel, how that made us feel. But then we could get stuck inward, turned inward, and we can just keep replaying that. We can keep telling the story, and we can keep just naming the hurts and telling the story and naming the hurts and telling the story and naming the hurts, right? And it doesn't, it doesn't get us anywhere. And so if we change our posture and we stretch out our arms like Jesus did and we receive his love, then we are able to let go and allow either reconciliation or release of that relationship. Forgiveness does not equal having to continue to have a person in your life. It can mean you release them, but it's a process, and it's a process that always begins from turning inward on yourself to turning outward to God's grace and God's love and Christ at work in your life. One more story about pets, because I have a lot of pets, and so I just have a lot of stories about pets. Um, we had to put down my beloved Mocha cat uh, in the middle of my anxiety breakdown. And so this was five years ago, and she had been, Mocha was Audrey, my daughter's best friend. Audrey told Mocha every secret, because she knew she would never tell anyone, right? So they went to bed together, all this stuff. Audrey knit her this little shawl that she wore. And we took her to the emergency clinic, and she had cancer, so we had to put her down. And, and it was months before I worked up the nerve to go pick up Mocha's ashes from the veterinary clinic because I was dreading it. I was dreading everything about that cinder block place and the cold walls and the cold floors. Everything about that place represented death to me because that's where we had left her, right? And I had to go pick up her ashes. So one day I was feeling strong enough, and I went in, and I was kind of trembling a little bit, and I said, I'm here for Mocha Fleetwood's ashes. And the lady said, okay, we've got a lot going on, because this is the emergency place, right? And she said, just a minute, I'll be right back. And she comes back, and she's holding in her hand this puppy that had just been born. 
And she says, I can't let go of this puppy. I have to keep patting it because when I stop patting it, it stops breathing. So I'm patting it to remind it to keep breathing. And she said, I know you've been waiting here for a little while. So here, keep patting this puppy and I'll go get Mocha's ashes. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, oh my gosh, please keep breathing. Please, keep, please keep breathing. And so here I am. I go to the veterinary clinic because of death, because my Mocha had died. And God puts into my hands life. And he says, just keep petting it. Just keep making it breathe, you guys. This is what God does in every aspect of your life. Whether it is something that you've done that you feel so shameful about and so guilty about, he's going to turn it into life whether it's something someone has done to you that you just can't let go of and it feels like a death happened and the old you is no more. That's good news. That's good news. There is a new you waiting to be reborn. We are reborn every moment of every day in Jesus Christ. We are a new creation because of his outstretched arms on the cross. When he was resurrected from the dead, we were resurrected with him through our faith. That's what I mean by an ocean of forgiveness. It is bigger than you can imagine. There is more love and more grace, more than enough to handle whatever death has occurred in your life. I'm asking you today to go from a posture of inward focus on yourself and on your sin and to take a step and to open your hands and to look up and to access the ocean of forgiveness and grace and love that is available to you. I want to play a song. And um, when I play this song, I want you to stand up and assume that outward focus posture. And whenever it feels right when this song plays, there will be a, a moment, a lyric, a phrase, and, and it will feel right. I want you to let open your hand, and I want you to let that piece of paper drop. That piece of paper that you've been holding tight in your clenched fist for the person that you can't forgive, for the thing that you've done that you can't release to God, that, that you've been holding on to so tightly, there will come a moment when you can let it drop. And then I want you to feel the freedom. If you've been holding that in your hand, your hand is tight and it is clenched, and it's painful. And when you open it, you're going to feel this sweet release, sweet release that only Jesus can give. So you can close your eyes. You can stand wide open and listen to this beautiful song. All right. One last thing. When it comes to forgiveness, there's no doubt that it helps to hear the words, I'm sorry. Something about those words our ears take it in and it travels down to our heart and it makes it a little bit easier to let go and to access that ocean of forgiveness. And so today, I want to represent some of the people in your life who have hurt you. And I'm going to, on their behalf, issue an apology. And it's not weird, because we don't need an apology from a person, but it does help. And so this exercise is, is to allow, you, allow your heart to break just a little bit more open and to be a little more receptive to the ocean of forgiveness that God has for you in, in the ways that you've been hurt. And so this is an exercise developed to help you move forward in the forgiveness process. And um, I'm just going to read these. Christy, is that okay if I just read them? Or do you want? Okay, that would be great. Sure. One more person would be great. So I'm going to have three people come up. One person is going to represent the men in your life that have hurt you. And... 
one person is going to represent females that have hurt you, and then one person will represent spiritual leaders that may have hurt you. And as we speak these words, I want you to just close your eyes, and if the thought comes to your mind, oh, I wish that he or she really would have said, or I needed to hear this, don't dismiss that. The Holy Spirit is is opening your heart and directing you into an area where you may, may need to open your hands and access that ocean of forgiveness. And I just pray that, that you would experience some freedom through this exercise. In 1 Samuel 25, it says, this is a time, um, this is based on 1 Samuel 25, when we ask for forgiveness for the sins of the people who have hurt and wronged us. And the intent is not to release the responsibility of these people that have hurt you, but rather it's a desire that God has for you to walk unhindered with him. When you are wronged, forgiving the one who wronged you is getting out of the way for God to do a work in you to heal your heart. All right? So let's start with with this. And if you would read that and close your eyes, you guys, and just open your heart to this exercise. It might feel weird, but it's not. The Holy Spirit is here, and he's going to work through these words. And just let yourself receive these words for situations in your life. As a man, I am here with a humble heart asking you to forgive me for the wrongs that I, as a man in your life, have done to you. I'm here as a friend or a boyfriend to ask for your forgiveness for the wrongs that I have done in your life. I'm here as a brother, as a father, to ask for your forgiveness for the wrongs that I have done in your life. I'm here as a man, one who is in authority in your life to ask you for the forgiveness for the wrongs that I have done to you in your life. As a friend, I am sorry for um, all the things that I've mistreated you for and for disrespecting you, for not being a Christian brother to you, for not treating you as one who God created. I'm sorry for the hurt I caused you. I'm sorry for making you feel unimportant. I'm sorry for leaving you out of the loop. I'm sorry for not calling on you. I'm sorry for making you feel that you were not my friend, for offending you for leaving you out of the group, for not valuing your friendship, for not including you in the group, for not calling you back, for letting you down. I'm sorry that I used you in ways a person should not be used. As a brother, I'm sorry for not respecting you as my sister. I'm sorry for neglecting you and for shaming you by not including you as my sister among my friends. I'm sorry for calling you bad or profane names. I'm sorry for looking down on you, for not standing up for you like a true brother should, for saying that I hate you, for saying that I I wish you were never my sister, for cursing you. I'm sorry for being a bad example for you and not living up to the calling that the Lord had on me. I'm sorry for using you, for mistreating you, for the physical abuse against you. I'm sorry for not loving you as a brother should. Please forgive me. As a father, I'm sorry for abuse, neglect, verbal assaults, mistreating you, disrespecting you, for thinking less of you than you are, for not being the right example of Jesus and the Lord called me to be. Please forgive me. As a sister, as a sister, I'm sorry for being such a brat while we were growing up and for the many times you took blame for my wrongdoing. I'm sorry for not even knowing you very well now that we are adults. I'm so sorry for not pursuing a relationship with you, for missing birthdays and for my selfishness. I'm sorry for making you feel like I was always the favored one. I have been so wrong and missed out on so much by not letting you into my life. Please forgive me. I have been so wrong. As a mother, I'm sorry for the arguing and yelling you heard in the night. I'm sorry for the things you heard me say to your dad and about your dad. I'm sorry for the divorce. It was not your fault. I'm so sorry for neglecting you, for not protecting you, and not believing you at times. I'm sorry for not being the mom, for how you had to take care of me. 
for putting you in the role of parent and me becoming a child. I'm sorry for controlling and manipulating you, for putting guilt and shame on you, for criticizing everything you do. I'm sorry for trying to form you into the image of what I think you should be. I'm sorry for blaming you for all the things that have gone wrong in my own life. I'm sorry for embarrassing you in front of your friends and putting you down. I'm sorry I haven't been a good example of Christ's love. I have been wrong. You deserve so much more. Please forgive me. Please hear these words that I have not said often enough. I am proud to call you my child. I love you. My heart is breaking because I now see the pain I have caused you. I have been so very wrong. Please forgive me. For any kind of spiritual leadership, pastors, small groups, shepherds. I'm sorry for how you've been treated by all spiritual authority in your life. I'm sorry we did not shepherd and protect you. That we didn't lead you through the dark days. That we weren't there for you when you were hurting and in pain. I'm so sorry for the empty words, not from our heart. I'm sorry for making you feel unwelcome and unwanted in God's house. I'm sorry for gossiping about you and for turning others against you and your family. I'm sorry for thinking of you only as a checkbook, for asking repeatedly for money without any care for the needs of your heart. I'm sorry for speaking words of anger from the pulpit, for manipulating you and your family with legalistic messages instead of loving and encouraging you. I'm sorry for giving counsel based on my own hurts and experiences. I'm sorry for thinking too highly of myself or being spiritually arrogant. I'm sorry for asking you to volunteer and serve more than I was willing to give myself, for asking you to commit and sacrifice when I was not willing to commit or sacrifice. I'm sorry for not being real with you, for putting on a persona that was not truth, for making myself appear as that I had no wrongs or faults. I'm sorry I could only see the faults in you and not myself. I'm sorry for being insecure and for believing that success of the church and success of the ministry was because of me and not because of the Lord. I'm sorry for not being your overseer, your elder, your under shepherd. I'm so sorry that I did not care for the flock. I'm sorry I didn't care about you or anything going on in your family, your health, the way a shepherd should. I'm sorry I didn't ask about you. I'm sorry I didn't call or visit when you needed me most. I'm sorry I forgot your name, your family, and who you were. I'm sorry for not knowing the condition of the flock or even caring at times. I'm sorry I didn't take a strong enough position in the church and put an end to the dissension and fighting like I should have. I'm sorry that I was afraid of people more than I feared God. I'm sorry that I was not a strong leader. I'm sorry that I let others ravage the church when I could have put an end to it. Sorry that I stood oddly by instead of stepping in to fight with you. I'm sorry for not taking care of my own family when I expected you to take care of yours. I'm so sorry for being a poor example. I am asking you to forgive me as your spiritual leader for many hurts and pains that I have caused you. I have been so wrong. Please forgive me. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with arms wide open, and we just ask, Lord, that your ocean of mercy and grace and love and forgiveness would wash over us. Lord, as we heard these words of apology, let them soak deep into our heart and into our soul and let them stir there and release pain and hurt and unforgiveness that has been weighing us down for a long time. 
Lord, let this morning be a rebirth, a recreation, a renewal of the life of freedom that you sent your son, Jesus, to die for, to give us. It's worth everything. It's worth everything, and it's there for us to claim. And so, Lord, we claim it today. We claim it. We hold it tight. We let go of all the yuck and the mess, and we claim the miracle. And let us walk into this day renewed and restored and refreshed to begin again in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you.